Good afternoon, and welcome to Close Looking at a Distance. I'm Keijo Lee, Assistant Director of Academic Affairs at the Cleveland Museum of Art, and we're so happy to welcome you back. Um, in this interactive guided program, uh, we will promote sustained attention to works of art in order to expand our understanding of the world and of each other. Um, we'll get going in a moment in order to give guests some time to continue to log in. But in the meantime, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It's having a little computer trouble. Great. Please familiarize yourself with the Q&A interface to the right of your screen. Um, that's our communication hub. I'll share ideas and information along the way, but I absolutely want to hear from you throughout the program. Use the Q&A to post your questions and comments, and I'll be following along. Your input also guides our focus. Lastly, you'll find links to the artworks we show and any other resources we mention in the description area directly beneath the live stream window on your screen. You'll also find a link to our Getting to Know You survey. Please complete it at some point during the program. The museum is currently open to the public, but since we can't gather in the galleries, we've taken the experience virtual. And close looking at a distance, as we move together from detail to detail and question to question, we'll collectively pursue meaning. And I want to thank you for taking the time to be in dialogue with me and with each other today. Now, during last week's desktop dialogue, Andrew Capetta and artist Hernez Davis discussed her move from representation to abstraction in her work, transforming her photo-based images, installations, and weavings into what um, she calls spaces of expression, meditation, anger, rest, as well as quiet spaces for self-care. Today, we're going to take a look at several works from our permanent collection, including a few um, by artist Norman, Norman Lewis, one by Mark Rothko, and the last by photographer Lorna Simpson. Each of these works exemplify an artistic strategy that, as a means of catharsis or protection, removes or refuses our, as viewers, access to um, a figure. So as we move to our first work, and when any image appears on your screen, you should feel welcome to express your first impressions in the Q&A. On your screen, you should see a black and white painting. Um, the black seems to sort of surround the white or pale beige at its center, but it's difficult to tell whether the black brush strokes are um, are placed on a white background that peeks through here and there, or if it's the reverse. Some of the light strokes take the shape of letters even, and the overall effect to my eyes like watching bits of flotsam like drift above the flames of a campfire. It's an abstract work or a piece in which figures and objects are not easily discernible. As you look at this first work, what do you notice? And while you're uh, posting, I'll give you a little bit of background about the artist, um, and this is by the painter uh, Norman Lewis. Um, uh, he began uh, painting during the Harlem Renaissance in the 1930s, so his body of work spans about um, uh, 40 years from the 1930s until the 1970s. He died in 1977. Um, and during the Harlem Renaissance, his work was both figurative and thoroughly engaged in social commentary um, and fitting very well into the strictures of kind of what was expected of a black Harlem Renaissance painter. Um, and these ideas were best expressed by Elaine Locke, whose influential book, The New Negro, which he wrote in 1925, would have been something that Lewis was very familiar with. Um, Locke says that there's uh, a need for distinctively Negro art, and he stressed the need for positive representations of African Americans um, and exhorted the value of figurative painting um, as a way to repair the, uh, the Black image in America. And so for the first 20 years of Norman Lewis's um, painting career, he fell in line with that. So now that you've had um, a look at this, wondering what it is that you might see. And maybe we can pull a little bit closer um, to give everyone uh, a better 
view of, of the paint strokes. Thank you so much. So though his work had been figurative um, in the uh, early 1930s through the early 1940s, you know, Lewis's work became more abstract right around the 1940s and um, uh, the middle of the 1940s. Uh, and at this point, he began to struggle kind of with the inefficacy of his paintings that uh, at bringing about social change. And so I'm going to give you a quotation from the artist. He says, and I quote, for many years, I too struggled single-mindedly to express social uh, conflict through my painting. However, gradually I came to realize that certain things are true. The development of one's aesthetic ability suffers from such emphasis. The content of truly creative work must be inherently aesthetic or the work becomes merely a form of illustration. Therefore, the goal of the artist must be aesthetic development and in a universal sense to make his in his own way some contribution to the culture. And so um, right at this moment that he um, uh, wrote this, which was part of an application that he made in 1949 um, for a fellowship at the Guggenheim, we see that he starts to talk about how um, giving a viewer an exact uh, um, image to contemplate didn't necessarily move people and didn't necessarily make the social change he hoped to see. Um, and so he started to move toward abstraction. Thanks, Joanne. Joanne says that this is like a web of black and white using wide strokes, almost like Japanese brushwork, um, very calligraphic. So maybe we can get really close to the brush strokes, maybe toward the left side in the middle. So near that um, concentration of white, but where we exactly, perfect. Um, and so here I think we're getting, we can see that these brushstrokes we get, we at, first of all, we get a sense of the brushstrokes, right? We can see how the paint is being dragged across the surface of the canvas um, at varying weights. Um, and probably uh, uh, where we see in this um, leftmost portion where we can see that that white pigment um, is allowing the black to show through, it was probably, um, lightly, uh, the brush was lightly dipped and dryish. Um, the canvas was dry to, to allow that drag to be there. Um, JD says, an angry opening mouth. Can we pull back out? Uh, JD, can you say where you see that mouth? Where in the composition, if you can identify that. And um, great eye, Joanne. So yeah, there are these brush strokes that seem to indicate letters where we were just looking. Um, the letters N and T, um, perhaps a letter I or a lowercase R. So we're starting to see, even in this abstraction, some things, some references that we all um, might have, even if we can't tell uh, precisely what this uh, image is meant to represent. Maybe if we can pull in toward the right side of the composition, um, showing the white area, yeah, and pull a bit closer. Perfect, move down just a little bit. Uh, maybe up, sorry. <laughs> Perfect. So, um, uh, though I don't yet see JD's response, Often, um, when I've taught with this uh, with this painting in the galleries, um, uh, viewers have seen an animal sort of emerging from the dark. Oh, perfect. So JD says the mouth is uh, the white portion, the black strokes look like teeth. Ah, so if we drawing all the way out, then if we look at this overall composition, it's like a mouth that's yawning open. But here's my question. Uh, if in this way, is it our mouth? If those are the teeth, where are we? Are we in the maw? At any, but that also speaks to me of a kind of sense of foreboding, 
right? So I'm wondering what kind of mood um, uh, you think this this painting sets. And uh, Joanne, thinking about this sort of Japanese brushwork or calligraphic style, we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. So uh, don't think that I've left it behind. But if we can think about the mood that this strikes and what you see that makes you say um, or dis or or uh, affirm a particular mood, um, if you could put that into the Q and A, I'd be appreciative. Like I said earlier on, it reminds me um, almost of a campfire, um, uh, sitting around and seeing the embers sort of float off. Um, oh, Molly says that uh, that um, she's never thought about that, but now she definitely sees teeth. Yeah, this kind of yawning, opening mouth. Um, I also in some ways see an entry into um, or an exit from a cave. So light at the end of, of um, a cavern. Uh, Peter from Columbus says, um, I find that his work is uh, very often delicate in terms of brushstrokes versus other abstract expressionists like Joan Mitchell. I wonder if this expressed his own struggles of trying to assert himself in the art world filled overwhelmingly with white artists. That's a really interesting um, point, Peter. So uh, while Norman Lewis was working in the same studio, spending quite a bit of time with all of the other abstract expressionists um, that were working in the 1940s, um, he was not uh, receiving the kind of notice and notoriety that, um, say, Jackson Pollock or Mark Rothko was. He worked in the same studio as Jackson Pollock. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, um, he spent time um, in a really important uh, um, kind of artist symposium that took place that was run by Robert Motherwell, among others. And uh, maybe a month after this symposium happened, there was a famous photograph of um, the painters of the moment on the cover of Life magazine called The Irascibles, from which he is uh, markedly absent. Um, and so in some ways, um, the way that this, thinking about what, uh, the weight of a brush indicate even about the um, emotional state or um, the or the idea, a concept, what concept the weight of a brushstroke might convey is really fascinating. Uh, Diane Harper says um, that it looks to me like one is in the bushes or trees looking toward the light outside. So there's a sense of directionality here, either that we are enclosed, being enclosed by that mouth, um, soon to emerge from um, a darkened space. Uh, and, you know, I think that these are all really compelling ideas about this particular about this particular work. And you can go and see um, uh, Alabama, which was painted in 1960 um, on view in Gallery 227 at the CMA right now. And so now that I've told you the title, which is Alabama 1960, does it transform or make you think in any different way about um, what this work might mean, what mood it sets? Right, titles can be really evocative, especially in terms of um, of abstract works. Right, and so uh, in some ways, um, one of the subjects that um, uh, Norman Lewis often painted were. Um, thinking through racial strife, racial um, uh, trauma, um, and civil rights, and the fight for civil rights in, in the United States. And so um, Molly says that she senses danger, right? So we, I, we see that kind of jagged, 
the jaggedness of the ends of the strokes, even though they're pretty curvilinear in their shape, but when they are all gathered together in this huddle, um, we get this sense of danger um, or fear. And so Joanne asks, is it a KKK picture? And so when you say um, a KKK picture, maybe you can express that a little bit more. Or Peter says um, that he thinks of the nightmare, the nighttime terrors of the KKK. And so, yes, in this embedded uh, and in many of his works from this era, he's thinking about um, the 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 Ku Klux Klan, but the sort of conflagration, the fires that seem to emerge around that group. So fires in the woods, um, burning crosses on lawns, um, those that kind of imagery, which has been distilled in down into right this this concentrated monochromatic. Um, composition of brushstrokes that are really difficult. If we can pull in really close again. Uh, um, toward the center, then we can really see this sort of concentration of brushstrokes that are um, uh, uh, incredibly tense and taut. Um, and so, and yes, yes, Diane, so thinking about like night raids with torches, the approaching. So there are some compositions that he has in which you even see sort of a curving line of this sort of white pigment um, in red and blue um, and black fields of color. And so um, we're going to move on to our next work, but I just wanted to mention that, you know, uh, um, I wanted to show this work because we can see him putting abstraction to work and expressing sort of social conflict, racial division and black trauma, perhaps as a way of releasing the pain, but also at, for activating his public. But it wasn't the only end to which he put abstraction. Um, uh, so if we can bring up our next uh, comparison slides, I'm going to show you uh, two other um, works from our permanent collection. Um, and one uh, was made earlier uh, than Alabama in 1957, and one was made in the same year. And as we look, I would like for you to pay close attention to the breadth of Lewis's techniques and approaches to abstraction. Um, and if we're looking at these two works, would you uh, put in the Q&A what differences and maybe uh, what similarities you see between the two works? For me, the first thing I notice is this reversal in the in the monochromatic palette so where it seems very distinctly black on white instead of this kind of white on black maybe um joanne asks is the meaning um in the image or in the title that's a really interesting question i'm of the mind that it's both and so i think that there that there is no way to escape um, the embeddedness of meaning in the materiality or in the way something is made. Um, and so for me, thinking about the weight of those brushstrokes, the way that the white, that the beige of the canvas bleeds through um, uh, the black, the way the, the black bleeds through the white, these complicated and stickiness, the sense of foreboding and danger, I think it heightens and they do interact with each other. Um, do I know if we, have got, we, if we would get to the clan if we didn't have a title? I think still perhaps, even if it were untitled, the fact that it's 1960, and all of the res resonances that we noted might bring us to that space. Um, so Molly says that she still senses fear or danger. Uh, the one on the right looks like barbed wire. Great, we're going to look at this more closely in a moment. Diane says that the one on the right looks like a landscape. What do you see that makes you say a landscape, Diane? Um, Patrick says um, sort of dark and light together. 
Um, uh, Joanne says that they're similar in their use of jagged lines, but they're softer in the painting. And so I'm wondering what you, which one you've identified as a painting already. And if you've identified that as a painting, then what is this that we're looking at now? What do you think it's made of, if not paint? Um, uh, Patrick says stark, rigid, and harsh. Um, and so I would love to hear what you mean by, with stark, I can see that it's a very spare comp composition, but when you say rigid, what do you see that makes you say um, rigid specifically? Um, and then, uh, so Peter says, I'm incredibly struck by the incredible beauty in so many of his works, probably in large part due to the delicate nature of his work. Can we get a little bit closer um, on this work so that we can actually see uh, the lines? Perfect, thank you. Salty says, I see both images having a movement quality with the gathering of brush strokes in the first one and the jagged lines in the second one. So we're getting a closer look at those jagged lines here. Um, and, uh, oh great, jo um, uh, Joanne says, it looks like scars to me. So thinking about how those lines um, uh, might mimic like the, the uh, the healing over of a wound when the skin sort of stretches at the edges. Um, and Joanne's thinking that it is a drawing. Um, and I would love to hear more about what you see that makes you say it's a drawing rather than a painting. And Diane says, the forms of hills and valleys, maybe we can draw back out again a moment, please. Um, uh, and seeing the dark on light contrast. So here we see that these curved, they're jagged, but they're curved, and, and we get this strange sense almost of space, like this little cluster of lines that's in the bottom right could be closer in the foreground to us, whereas um, uh, further receding might be a peak, a mountain peak in the, in, in the back, um, uh, receding into space. Chloe says the second work looks more like an embroidery zoomed out. So yeah, there's this funniness about medium in this work. Um, I love this idea of it looking like uh, something sewn, but it also isn't so distant from the idea of it being uh, um, uh, a scar because it could also be like a suture. Um, and I can't take credit for that. Um, my colleague Andrew noticed that um, as we were discussing this yesterday. Uh, and then the kind of the delicacy and the subtle shading seem more like a drawing. And you're absolutely right. So this is ink on paper. And if we can get a little bit closer again. Um, if we can zoom in on, uh, let's go, yes. Um, if we can move to the left. So we can see like the ends of one of these tendrils and get as close to it as possible. Yeah, so maybe the top one and if we get cl as close to the uh, end, perfect, thank you. So here we can really get um, a sense of how he's making these um, these lines, right? So so we see this kind of dragging of the line and then these flicks to drag the pigment up and down um, each of the each of the sides of that of that single line. Um, let's see. Diane says, I'm not trying to make light of this, but it looks like my string of Christmas lights tangled on the floor. That's not making light of anything. So these abstract, abstract works function on multiple levels. Artists may be making uh, very clear statements, but often they want to evoke something, uh, whether it be a memory, whether it be um, a, a, a particular idea. For instance, um, Joanne, we're going to we're bringing it back to your idea about um, Japanese uh, painting and calligraphy. In fact, Norman Lewis was trained in both Chinese and Japanese calligraphy and really compelled um, by uh, ink drawings and paintings. And so I think you're seeing a lot of that. And if we draw back out, not just in um, the the content in the form, but even in 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 the 
composition, the spare uh, quality of this, right? It's a very different, and this is called winter branches, right? And so it's a very different way of utilizing abstraction, not necessarily uh, toward this idea of um, social progress, right? But as an expression of uh, beauty um, and a very uh, sort of ambiguous suggestion of, uh, of nature, right? So um, I think, so we can see how he's invested in these and now we're going to, uh, uh, and while, you know, in the 1930s and, and 40s, he was really vocal about his disdain for the plight of African Americans, but he was simultaneously vocal, um, especially in the late, late 1940s and early 1950s about not allowing his art to become illustrations for social justice, um, social injustice and racial pain. And he worked with the federal art program of the WPA in the 30s. Then he was active in the Artists Union um, and the Harlem Artists Guild in the 40s and 50s at the same time that he was exhibiting um, with the American Abstract Expressionists, right? So there's a way in which he is um, uh, thinking about his place as an artist very broadly. And yes, and Joanne, yes, also this asymmetry, which gives us this, uh, um, um, this sense of, of a sort of proper balance right, in terms of um, his quotations of Asian art. Please continue to drop any other ideas that you have, but we're gonna look at something else. So if we can bring up Winter Branches and Untitled, that would be fantastic. Perfect. So I'll ask you again, what are the differences and or similarities you see between these two works? In some ways, what I find so fascinating about Norman Lewis's body of work is that they could really have been made by a different hand, right? So, so each of the um, three works that I've shown you, so Alabama from 1960, Winter Branches from 1957, and now this is an untitled work from 1960, are from a single hand, but they are expressed so very differently. So I'm wondering what differences and similarities you notice. Thanks, Joanne. To, yes, that's why he endures, why his work endures. Well, you know, uh, Lewis is experiencing a kind of renaissance. He uh, died um, in relative obscurity and quite angry about it. Um, uh, I know a bit about his work in, um, in uh graduate school, I was privileged to go to a gallery um, that's closely associated with his estate and to see a couple of works that have never been on view. And they looked like nothing I'd ever seen um, by him because I was quite used to in classes seeing um, his abstractions and his figurative works as more of a protest. Uh, so the first thing that folks are noticing are this addition of color. And that was one of the things that I found so interesting. So these two pieces that I looked at, one was on linen and one was on burlap. But the most interesting part was they were um, unprimed. So he's like grinding pig pigment into the surface. Um, in some ways, Untitled uh, reminds me most of those two works. So yes, one of the biggest uh, differences is the addition of color. Are there any, is there anything else or any similarities you might see? One of the similarities I see is the way this kind of balance between the um, areas of color and uh, the line. And maybe we can, um, go ahead and look at Untitled alone so that folks, it's a little bit more difficult to see in comparison if you're looking at a smaller screen. Great, and maybe we can uh, zoom in just a little bit so that folks can get um, a sense of the line. Interesting, um, so uh, Joanne says that the color is very subtle and so very zen, but at the same time, Diane says it's reminiscent of the views of the California fires. I'd be really interested in hearing what you see that makes you say that, Diane, and then um, 
uh, let's move back out again um, because Joanne is saying that there's this isolation of the line groupings. So like winter branches, we have these lines that are gathered, but they're sort of grouped. And especially I think um, in that sweep from the middle left that curves around toward the center, and then there seems to be a second little um, group of lines. Um, uh, it seems that there's this kind of rhythm that he's making across this surface. Uh, and Joanne says the color um, is what uh, connects the composition. And if I'm reading that correctly, I'm thinking that it's how these uh, this haze of blush especially um, is placed around the composition, which kind of leads your eye, punctuated by this gray green. Um, color. Salty says this one seems blurrier and more hazy. Yeah, there's a kind of atmospheric quality um, in this one. Can we get very close to the center of this composition where we see that blush and greens get perfect? So we can see um, that there is this kind of uh, way that there's almost like a screen through which those lines are are showing through. Um, uh, so Diane says that um, she's received pictures from a nephew with the fire showing in the sky at the distance through the houses and trees. Yeah, this kind of are um, uh, looking at a sort of atmospheric image or an aerial image of the fires in California. And if we draw out again, there is there can be a kind of terrible beauty to those hazy images. Um, let's see. So Laura says um, uh, that although abstract, um, uh, they see a tie into embroidery and stitching, maybe a connection to folk art. I would love to hear more about um, about uh, the tie you see between this work and the embroidery and stitching. Um, and yes, so something like a, like craft, um, embroidery, stitching, knitting, um, weaving, those things do tend to have those, those deeper connections. I believe Hernes Davis in the desktop dialogue last week talked a bit about this in, uh, in her weaving. Um, uh, Diane wonders if that kind of hazy quality that seems to lay across the t uh, across the top of the harsher lines is an attempt to soften them, and then the kind of triangle. So if we could go, um, let's go into the upper right of this composition. Uh, yes, thank you. Where we see that concentration of triangles um, there, which also gives uh, um, credence to what Diane was saying about trees um, in the distance and through a haze. Uh, um, and we see this kind of, not just the, the harshness of the lines maybe that you're noting, but the shape, right? These incredibly sharp, triangles um, that are peering through uh, um, that that lightly chromatic haze and using contrasting colors but not necessarily I'm sorry if we draw right out uh, out again um, this uh, contrasting between this between red and green or here between this pinkish blush color and this um, almost steely grayish green um, so there's a contrast but it it's not hot. It doesn't. Uh, um, it doesn't raise the energy. Excuse me, or make a kind of frenzy. It's much, much softer. And so, um, you know, in some ways, I see uh, in this what uh, Lewis expressed in an interview he did with Henry Ghent in 1968. And he says about this push and pull between abstraction and figuration between socially uh, social protest work and this kind of free space. Um, he says, and I quote, well, you see, my whole becoming and my whole involvement in the left wing Painting became one thing, and fighting for the cause of the working man in America was another. Lewis doesn't explain what that one thing in painting was, but uh, became for him, but he does sometimes call these paintings a space of becoming. Um, <clears throat> 
And if we can maybe look at the whole composition again and maybe go back, maybe if we can go back to that comparison between winter branches and untitled, that would be perfect. Great. Because when I think about this space of becoming, right, I think about all of the different ways that he is using different media, different techniques, but all to articulate a kind of abstraction. And to let you know, the medium of Untitled is actually oil on paper. Right, really interesting. So using this kind of absorptive surface um, uh, to play around with paint and to think differently, I, I think, about drawing. Yes. So drawing with watercolor, but it's um, but it's actually oil. But then he plays with that medium such that it speaks to you like a watercolor. It has that kind of filtered quality that if this were canvas, especially primed canvas, it would um, the effect would not uh, hold. But he does have canvas. Well, not even canvas. They are linen and burlap works that are unprimed in which he's he grinds the oil into it to similar effect. Um, so there's an interesting correspondence between those two. Um, we're getting low on time, so I want us to move on to look at, um, oh, before we move on, uh, Diane says um, that she does see this as the unrest of the 1960s and today the kind of burning of buildings. So we do see some resonance with our current moment. How do we make visible, right, racial pain and trauma, which, uh, um, and what are the responses um, uh, um, when people feel um, that they are not being seen and heard? In multiple ways, um, we get, uh, uh, we can end in a, in a kind of conflagration. Um, and so, and yes, Joey, he did draw in ink. And so, um, uh, and Salty says, a space of becoming sounds perfect for these images, especially for Untitled, if you imagine the darker angular shapes peeking through the composition. Yes, in a paper that I once wrote, I think about those black marks, those spaces, as spaces in which he can hide as a space to become like a kind of cocoon. I want us to move on to our next um, uh, comparison really swiftly before we run out of time. Because this is, uh, we see Norman Lewis is untitled on the left, and we see Mark Rothko's uh, number two um, on the right. And so they are both abstract expressionists, and, uh, but they are two different artists. So I want to ask you what differences you see or similarities between these two works. And I want to read, a, as you're doing that, I want to read a quotation to you from Mark Rothko. He says, and I quote, the tragic experience of catharsis is the only source of any art. I'm not interested in the relationship of color and form or something in this spirit. I'm interested only in expressing the basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, and despair. And so there, there are some other similarities between these two artists in that he also began as a figurative painter in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and then around 1940, he became really invested in the writings of Freud and Jung. And he, um, and he uh, left painting for a time to fully immerse himself in the idea of the collective unconscious. And uh, archetypal interpretations of dreams. And then as a result of that, he started doing these sort of symbolist works. And from there, in the early 1950s, abstract expression, his version of abstract expression, abstract expressionism became something. Speaking of the painting of other artists often having a calming and relaxing effect, Rothko said that his works, and I quote, have the opposite goal, end quote, and are written not for history or studios, but for the people whose reaction was the only value. Um, and so, yes, Lisa, we do have a Rothko in the collection. Um, uh, and um, uh, I don't think it is currently on view. It's not currently on view, but yes, we do. Let's see. So Diane says that uh, she doesn't get as much emotion from the Rothko, 
Um, and while the and Joanne knows that they're both neutral palettes, but the Rothko is more spare in design. So we're going to stick with this Rothko just for a moment. Um, and so they have his trademark bars of color, um, hor uh, horizontally oriented. Um, and for those of you who may be familiar with Rothko's work, um, it's funny to me when I read that he is really interested in provoking strong reactions. Um, oh, thank you. In between that bar of dark and that bar of kind of orangey perfect thank you when we get really close what do you notice oh great it's also in gallery 227 in the same place as Alabama you can experience them at once close to this and maybe there's something a bit reminiscent of um, of the untitled work here Oh my. <laughs> um, oh, uh, let's draw back out a moment so that we can see the full composition. Thank you. And so, in many ways, what I mostly see when I see um, uh, visitors looking at a Rothko, whether it's in our collection or others, is I see a, a silence that these provoke, which I find fascinating, um, uh, given um, using sort of yeah he's using a dry brush technique um and on canvas that is very very lightly primed um it allows yes there's a bleeding of um uh so from afar we can think about uh maybe minimalist artworks in which these registers these rectangular shapes would be very perfect you would lose the hand of the artist but here if we get if we can go closer again rectangles, then we get to see this kind of bleeding, right? Yes. So we see this kind of drop down of that grayish blue, this lift up of that ochre yellow. Now we are very low on time, so I have to speed. So let's go to our next, our final image. Because I just wanted to give you um, a sense that abstraction or the removal of a figure um, also happens in photography. So we're going to look at, yes, as we end today, we're going to leave you with a final work by the photographer Lorna Simpson. Simpson regularly removes figures, often women, and turns them away from the, or turns them away from the camera and thus from our view as a means of affirming agency and denying the violence of our gaze. It's a very different medium, but a similar artistic act to move toward abstraction as a means of release, be it a matter of political expression, free creativity, societal or personal trauma. So um, I thank you so much for joining uh, me for this conversation today. Uh, Close Looking at a Distance has been made possible uh, in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And now here's my colleague, Andrew Capetta, to tell you about the next desktop dialogue. Andrew? Oh, we seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, and so just um, while we're waiting for him to pop on, remember, if you would like to explore more of the work in our collection, visit the CMA collection online. A link is in the description. Um, and if we didn't get to your question or comment during uh, the program, or if you have more, you can always go to Art Lens Ask on the CMA web website, link also in the description, um, and someone will get back to you with an answer. And if you could 
please complete the survey. It helps us to craft our future programming. Okay, great. And here's Andrew to talk about the next desktop dialogue. Hey, thanks, Kijo. Um, <clears throat> so our next desktop dialogue uh, is titled Making a Meaning in MOLA Textiles, and it's next Wednesday, November 18th at noon. So please come. We're going to be discussing how materials and fabrication processes convey meaning in works of art, uh, focusing on MOLAs, which are a key component of the traditional dress among the indigenous Guna women of Panama. Um, and also the subject of an upcoming CMA exhibition, Fashioning Identity, MOLA Textiles of Panama. Uh, we're going to be joined by CMA Research Fellow Andrea Vasquez de Arthur, who's the curator of the exhibition, and the, uh, museum guide Leonardo uh, Perez Carreño from the Museo de la Mola in Panama City, Panama. It's our first international desktop dialogue. We're really excited. Uh, so please come. Excellent. Thanks so much for sharing that with us, Andrew. It's going to be fascinating. Um, just know that the close looking at a distance following um, this desktop dialogue won't happen until December 9th. We're gonna take a brief hiatus. Thank you again, everyone, so much for um, being with us today and we'll see you next time. Thank you.